Now, as fun as this was going to be, it was important to remember that first and foremost, this was a rescue mission. There are around 75 men, women and children being held in chains by Vexifius and his men. The ones he didn't keep for himself would be dragged further north and sold off. Any too infirm to be of service as a slave would be sacrificed to his disgusting rituals. I had to make certain these people were safe before I could take any action against the big man and his goons. Good thing we had a plan. From high in the air, far above the prying eyes of the elves guarding the compound, we flew to where Pete's drones had discovered the slaves' quarters were. This was in the dirtiest section of the estate. The buildings were run down, the ground was covered in filth from animal waste and other such things. I bet the smell alone could stun you if you weren't prepared for it. Everything about this wretched place was squalid and offensive to my modern sensibilities. Son of a bitch is making children live in the squalor. I muttered to myself angrily, tossing a glance at the girl watching cartoons in the back of Skywolf, laughing at what she saw and blissfully unaware of what we floated above. Yes, Borman said quietly. His air sickness had dissipated at the sight of where he'd once been held prisoner, and now a thunderous expression of righteous anger covered his face. The indignity is contained within these walls, Forge Knight. You have no idea the depravities we've seen and endured. The elves were determined to break our wills, to make us forget ourselves as human beings. They wanted to turn us into animals for their own cruel amusement. That bad, huh? I asked him. Far worse than you realize. I won't go into detail, but even now, at this time of night, I imagine the pens are filled with elves seeking to have a little fun with the prisoners. I'm worried now, because when we strike, there's a good chance they'll try to slay as many captives as they can, despite our efforts. Are they that crazy? They're worse than insane, Forge Knight. They're prideful. The idea of losing to humanity at anything wounds their pride, and an elf with a wounded ego is worse than a frothing rabbit dog. I'm glad, I said with a sneer on my face. As I stared down at the pens. You're glad? Borman asked me. Why would such knowledge be of cheer to you? Didn't you hear what I just said they'd do? I did, but they ain't gonna get a chance to act out, I told him. Just watch what me and Pete do, big man. Enjoy the show. Having said that, I held on my forge ring. You ready, partner? I asked him. Indeed I am, sir, came Pete's reply. Awesome, I said happily. Wall, times four. Make them big, part. Neva grinned in delight at the expressions the female human wore on her face as he approached her. She was a teenager, recently flowered into young adulthood, and he'd had his eye on her for quite some time. He knew he wasn't supposed to touch the product. Lord Vexavius had been quite clear about that in the past, but Neva couldn't help himself. She was so pretty, so live, so sweet-smelling, and she trembled so, like a fawn separated from his mother. He resisted his urges for as long as he could, but now he could do so no longer. He had to claim her. He had to have her. It would be a moment of ecstatic bliss for them both. Sadly, he'd have to kill her afterwards and make it seem as though she'd run away, but such was the melancholic price of a love consummated. He was certain she wouldn't mind. A passion like theirs would be worth the cost of one small life. Besides, under his touch, she'd live a thousand lives before he slit her throat. Wouldn't she be grateful? How could she not be? Come here, little doe, he grinned after unsheathing his blade. Come here, come here, come here. Let me love you, he began to whisper, when suddenly the floors of the slave pens began to shake, nearly causing him to fall. What? Kniva asked no one in particular, in his frightened confusion. What is this? What's going on? All across the building, other elves like him who'd come seeking discreet pleasures in the dark, were also startled, as massive stone walls erupted from the earth on all sides of the pens, trapping everyone inside. Construction is complete, Sir Matthew. The slave pens are now completely sealed off. Well, in the words of the great Matthew McConaughey, all right, all right, all right, I said with a smile. Next step, remember that trick we did a few weeks back with the shields and the scanners? I do indeed, Sir Matthew. Would you like me to apply a scanner times four for each wall? Do it, buddy, I said encouragingly. At once, sir. Construction now complete. All right, Pete. Now give me a count of every single human being trapped in there. Yes, sir. I count 83 humans occupying the space. Shoot, it's worse than we thought, I said with a frown. Okay, then how many elves are in there? 23, sir. Paint them on the screen, Pete. And add a few cameras, too. Feed the images into Skywall's display. I want to see how they're reacting to what we've done. 
Pete did as I asked at once. And once more, the technology behind his creations left me feeling stunned. I was seeing perfect real life imagery of those elf bastards in high definition and colour. Their confusion and consternated expressions put a smile on my face. I loved messing with bullies. Sadly though, my smile was short lived, because thanks to the camera feed I could also see the environment the humans had been kept in. I saw dry bloodstains everywhere, pale broken people locked in filthy cells that were barely larger than cages. I never knew a grown person could look so much like a neglected rescue animal. The haunted looks of the perpetually traumatised would be with me for the rest of my life. I also saw that when the wars came up many of the elves had literally been caught with their pants down. They had been… no. No, I wasn't going to describe what they'd been doing. I wasn't going to dwell on the awful things I'd just seen. This was just the final proof, was all. These bastards were beyond redemption. I needed to go. They needed to go right now, this very second. The sweet air of life was a luxury they no longer deserved. They brought this on themselves. By your acts you reveal your nature. By your deeds you condemn yourselves. I whispered to myself. Sir? Pete asked me. Just a little wisdom from the mountain, Pete. Something I always try to remember before I act out in anger, I said to him. I see. Well, would you like me to now generate some chains to bind the elves contained within the pens? You know, Pete, I don't think I would. I think I'd like you to generate something with a little more finality for our long-eared friends down there. You ever heard of a historical ruler from Eastern Europe? Went by the name of Vlad Dracul? I have. He was a Romanian monarch, famous for successfully defending his small nation against the Ottoman Empire. He was a daring warrior and a brilliant tactician. Why bring him up? Well, Pete, invading nations during the Middle Ages weren't known for their gentle treatment of the people whose lands they conquered. And since Romania was such a small and tempting target, old Vlad had to put up with a lot of unwanted visitors to his country over the years. That was, until he came up with the concept of a Romanian scarecrow. A brilliant innovation which strongly encouraged his curious neighbours to stay the fuck out of his lands. And do you know how he made those scarecrows? I believe I do, sir, P said quietly. I'm glad you catch on so quickly, Pard. Lock onto those elves. Make sure they're a safe distance from the captives before you strike. Stakes, times 23. Complying. Is Lord Vexevius doing this? One of Geneva's fellow guards asked. How should I know? Geneva spat out. But inwardly, he wondered about that as well. Vexevius was a powerful user of dark magic. Although he'd never done anything as outwardly spectacular as forging walls from the very earth, Geneva didn't doubt he was capable of it. But why? Why would he do this? Vexevius might seem mad to others, but wasn't that just a mask he wore to disguise his clever mind? Would he really do something so utterly mad to the occupants of the slay pens, his little guards included on a mere whim? He wouldn't, would he? Would he? He would. Listen, Geneva shouted to the other guards. We must get out of here. We must escape now. Our bloody lord might be about to do something. What in the name of desolation? He said in a whisper. <sighs> a spike erupted from beneath the ground with terrifying speed and impelled the elf he had been speaking with earlier. It shot directly through him in a straight line, with the sharp tip exiting through his mouth. <laughs> Kick, he said. He was still alive, still trying to breathe, even with the stake running through him. Shh, shh, shh. While around Geneva, the spike shot up, catching screaming elves off guard and quickly silencing them. Some tried to run, some screamed angrily and demanded their attackers show themselves. Some fools tried climbing up wooden pillars towards the ceiling, but nothing they did mattered. One after the other, each elf met their stake. Shh. All of them except Geneva, who was utterly shocked to realise that not only hadn't he been driven insane by terror, but he was also somehow still alive. And that was when he noticed it. Not a single one of those spikes had targeted a human being, only the elves. A human was doing this. A human had dared to bear its fangs against a superior being. That's… that's not right, he murmured. That's not how it's supposed to be. You haven't got the right, you nasty little beasts. Killing us is indecent. It's unfair. Isn't that so? What do you think, my sweet little doe? He asked the girl, whose arm he clung to desperately. As though his life depended on it. 
One elf remaining, Sir Matthew. We could not successfully impale him without risking injury to his hostage. I'm sorry. That's okay, Pete. I know you tried your best. I told him reassuringly. Sometimes things don't work out as planned. And for times like those, that's when a man should rely on the classics. Show yourself, sorcerer! The increasingly unhinged Kniva shouted. Show yourself! I demand it! Face me fairly! All around him, the impaled and immobilized elves continued to moan and suck in their horrible, ragged breaths, their blood and filth everywhere. The noises, the smells, the desperation to live. It was all driving him positively mad. I won't die like this, Kaliva shrieked with a hyper squill. I am of the night, eternal. I should always walk these lands. I don't deserve this. I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. Tell him, Doe. Tell him I didn't touch you. Tell him. Even though you tried to tell me like the filthy tart that you are. Whore, slatter, damn you. I won't die. I won't die. I won't die. Please help me. I love you. He shook the girl desperately, trying to make her understand. In his frenzy, he noticed too late that something had materialized in the air above him and was now plummeting down towards his head. Moments earlier. Anvil, I said. A large anvil appeared from nowhere and landed directly on Kaliva's skull. It didn't have enough momentum to kill him outright, but it was more than enough to break his neck on impact, separating him from the girl who quickly scrambled away from his prone body. You'd think that being paralysed would have been sufficient punishment for the monster. Sadly for him, Matthew had a bit of an obsessive streak when it came to taking these sorts of measures against the people he'd rightfully despised, so for the sake of his completionism, and not just a little bit of sadism, Kaneva was also given a stake of his own. <sharp inhale> By the gods, you've got a vicious streak in you, Borman told me with widened eyes. Sir, I'm sure I don't know what you mean, I told him. All I saw were a bunch of dying assholes getting a small serving of the hell they surely deserved. You had to live in that place for a time, didn't you? Tell me they didn't have it coming. I won't lie and say they didn't deserve far worse, Borman told me. But if you truly are a knight, sir, then you owe it yourself not to take such glee in the suffering of your foes. Even the ones who deserve it most. Yeah, that's a hard pass for me, big man, I told him. I view this knighthood thing as a job, not a calling. If I could put every son of a bitch in existence who has it coming on a spike, I'd do it while sipping a Pepsi. I'm a corn man, you see. Calling decorum just doesn't suit my kind. See justice, not vengeance, Forge Knight, Borman said. For your own sake, not theirs. I frowned at his words, but I said nothing in reply. Borman was older than me and more experienced at this game than I was. Just because his self-assuredness irritated me, didn't mean I couldn't learn from him. I had once dismissed good advice out of spite before, and it had cost me dearly. So dearly, in fact, that I blindly accepted a job that got me stuck on another world in an entirely different dimension, getting constantly chased by people who wanted to cut my dang head off. So yeah, it never hurts to listen to good advice. Sir Matthew, the compound has been alerted to our presence, Pete cut in before we could continue our speaking. On the screen I saw dozens of elves wearing armour and bearing bows and ember rods massing below. Most were focused on the slave pens, but a few were now pointing upwards, having seen us. Elves had pretty good night vision, it seemed. How many? I asked Pete. 64, sir, he informed me. Ah, I was hoping for more. Many of them remain in the manor, providing protection for Vexavius and his household, Pete informed me. So... We're going to have to go in after them when we finish with this crowd. That's a shame. Hell, why don't we just blow up the main building itself and save ourselves a bunch of work? I asked him. You are not, hissed a mender from behind me. Doing so may damage my necklace. Remember our deal. Ugh, fine, I said. You're a real slave driver sometimes, you know that, Mendy? Sir, that joke is very inappropriate for this occasion, Pete said in a scandalized tone of voice. Be mindful of the circumstances of the people we're assisting. My bad, my bad. I said apologetically. All right, let's get some targets lined up. Time for phase two. Are we still going to call phase two Pew Pew Shooty Shoot? Asked Pete. It's not like you thought of a better name, I said defensively. I wanted to call it Hammerfall, Borman said. And I said you don't get a vote if you're a junior member of the team, I snapped at him. For untold centuries, the Dark Elves considered themselves the pinnacle of existence. They were warriors without peers, and who could prove them wrong? They were physically stronger and faster than any other humanoid race in the world. More importantly, their virtually immortal lifespans meant that their knowledge of battle was unmatched. Their fighters had encountered all possible permutations of warfare, and knew how to counter or escape each scenario. 
Nothing was beyond their experience. Except this. This was something entirely new. Bring that thing down! Come on to the captain of Lord Vexepheus' personal guard. Ember rods up! Fire! Fire! Each shot struck true. The captain confirmed it himself with his excellent eyesight. It was just that they achieved nothing. We should have been impossible. These rods were weapons of matchless quality, not mere branches carved from common oak with cheap gems inserted. How could that thing above them be so resilient? Our heat resistant armor is working remarkably well, Sir Matthew, Pete informed him. No damage received. All the extra work you put in is paying off nicely, part, I said in praise of my partner. Well done. Oh, thank you, sir. It pleases me to be of service. Building a helicopter to siege Vexepheus's land had been my idea, originally. I'd envisioned a smaller vehicle flying around, strafing the area, and avoiding return fire. But Pete beat my original idea by a country mile when he opined that siege vehicles ought to be big, mean, and unstoppable. Instead of relying on speed and agility, why not just throw aside any needless complexity and build something with thick armour that delivered overwhelming force to the enemy? A real mean aerial bully who could dominate ground-based forces with ease and laugh at his victims' feeble attempts to fight back. With that philosophy in mind, Pete and I built Skywolf, who answered the question, what if a naval destroyer and a helicopter had a child? And what if that child had anger issues? With two shots from the cannons on either side of it, the Iron Bird struck down a dozen men. Not one of them was under 300 years of age. An incredible loss, not only to the captain's fighting force, but to all elven kind, everywhere. Keep firing, he shouted over the panic screams of his warriors, as the monster continued his assault, erasing another group of his men. He forced them to remain calm, keeping order through sheer strength of will. Keep firing! Sorceress, prepare a counter-assault! Place a defensive shield! Then I want you to knock that iron abomination out of the sky! Send it crashing to the earth! This machina is unparalleled, Former said in wonder as the miniguns sprayed countless rounds of ammunition into the massed elves, shredding them into confetti by effortlessly tearing through their armoured bodies. Kiss the cook, not me, I said, referencing my partner. Peace someone who reminded me that minigun was one word, while well, we were assembling this beast. Construct, your wisdom is a sight to behold, Foreman said to Pete, with a respectful bow of his head. During more peaceful circumstances, I would happily kneel at your foot to partake of your knowledge. You would? Really? Oh my... So Matthew is always telling me to be quiet. Goodness, what a change in pace that would be. Pete, be quiet and stay focused, please. I told him with a frown. And don't be so quick to jump over to the next fella who tells you how pretty you are. Show some self-respect. Would you be showing some self-respect if I asked you to respect me more? He asked. Now you're just giving me lip, I said crossly. My apologies, sir. Oh, I'm detecting an etheric disturbance. It would appear that a group of the Dark Elves are attempting to use a gravitational spell to pull the Skywolf from the air. How long we got? Less than 40 seconds, sir. Ain't the bullets getting through? They appear to have enacted a protective shield that is reducing the effectiveness of our guns. Are they? Well, I bet you a dollar that shield won't protect them from feeling superheated air. Are you suggesting we use the napalm launcher and the flamethrowers? And you thought having those would be overkill? I said to him smugly. No, I said using them would be overkill, Pete said primly, and possibly a war crime. Hey, they're the ones trying to shoot us down for freeing slaves. I don't see how anything done for the sake of liberty could possibly be immoral. Oh, sir. It's as though you're going out of your way to be difficult towards others. Heh. <laughs> Ain't that the truth. Aren't you ready yet? The captain asked his sorcerers. The others can't maintain this shield for much longer. The power continues to search within us, Lord Captain, cried one of them. Twenty seconds more, and we shall be ready to strike. The captain bit back a retort, knowing that yelling at these sluggard magic users wouldn't get them to hurry. Thus far, this battle had been the most terrifying of his career. No, the most terrifying of his eight centuries of life. But 20 seconds was nothing, even if at the moment it felt like it was an eternity away. He would survive this. He always survived. Kill me! Kill me! Kill me! It burns! He screamed, as the flames consumed him and his useless sorcerers. It appears you've earned a dollar, sir, P said, as he watched the Resistance's leadership enjoy a soothing napalm sauna. Give it an escrow for me, pard, I said. How many are left down there? Less than twenty, sir, but with their captain deceased, their will to resist appears to have been broken. They are currently fleeing into the woods. Nice. 
Send the drones after them. No need for us to go hunting the riffraff. It's time we settle things with the boss man himself. You ready, big man? I asked Borman. I have dreamt of this night more times than you can ever know, Forge Knight. He replied with a grim expression on his face. Man. Some people just couldn't lighten up, could they? I had Pete take us to the ground so we could disembark safely. Borman and I were hardly airborne troopers, so the idea of jumping out or rappelling down was definitely off the table. Instead, we landed and walked out like two sane people who didn't want to shatter our ankles at the joint. Once we were out, I had Skywolf go back to the sky to keep his two remaining occupants safely out of the enemy's reach. Pete was a master of multitasking and could easily pilot him while assisting me. Now we bring this thing to justice, Borman growled, as he lowered the visor of his helmet. And what a helmet it was! When he and Amender insisted on joining in on the raid, I knew we couldn't just let him wade into combat in his slave's rags. So, Pete took a quick measurement of him and crafted what was probably the finest set of armour that Borman had ever worn in his life. I mentioned it a few times before, but everything that Pete creates is of the highest possible quality imaginable. The gear that Borman was wearing felt light as a feather, but it was miles beyond anything any smith on this planet could ever hope to craft. This armour could block bullets, dissipate heat, and was insulated against the cold. No weapon could penetrate it or even dent it. By medieval standards, whoever wore this equipment was the god dang Terminator. Nothing could stop his owner except exhaustion. Borman had accepted the armour, along with the massive warhammer we also made him, with a stunned expression followed by a cheer of joy and an oath of eternal brotherhood. I guess he thought his equipment was magical or something, and by the standards of this world I guess it was. So yeah, more power to him. I was just pleased he'd gotten over me kicking him in the jaws. I was also wearing a similar set of armour. It was plainer looking, nothing ornate and beautiful like what Borman had on, but I didn't care about looks. I just needed something that would stop arrows and fireballs and whatever else the locals wanted to throw at me. I also needed it for back support, due to the weight of the massive minigun I was currently lugging around. That's right, I was about to tap into my inner Jesse Ventura. Can you blame me? I asked Borman earlier if he wanted one for himself, but he refused. Apparently the knights of his order were on about to face their foes in melee combat only. Ranged weaponry was for cowards. That was fine by me. The phrase, a coward dies a thousand deaths, a hero dies but once, made it sound to me like cowards got to live a nice long life. The front door of the manor smashed open easily beneath the force of Borman's kick. I followed him immediately, prepared to open fire. Knock, 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 is there anybody home? I asked. In response, about a dozen nails came running at us from either side of the massive entry room, howling madly for our blood. Borman charged fearlessly at his attackers, swinging his hammer in a wide arc that crushed one of their skulls with a single merciless swing. One thrust a dagger into his side, attempting to find a weakness in his armour, any bit of exposed flesh that he could sink his blade in. All he got for his efforts was a vicious backhand to the face, followed by another crushing swing of that hammer right on top of his skull. Come on, you weaklings! Bring it! He shouted as he waded into them, killing another one with an armored elbow directly to his windpipe. Good lord. Borman wasn't just a dumbass with a big body. It took serious training and experience to understand how to weaponize armor as well as he could. The way he timed his strikes with his warhammer was also brutal in his sheer precision. He was the real deal. I think I understood why Mandy was so into him, since Dragons admired strength so much. Die! He shouted again as he smashed his hammer directly into the face of an elf who was too terrified to move, turning the poor bastard's good looks into mushy kinetic gore. Man, talk about making an impact in someone's life. Dang, I don't think I'll be having a rematch with this fella anytime soon if I can help it. Honestly, just watching Borman go at it with his victims, uh, I mean his honourable opponents, was enough to make me feel tired. I was just a simpler kind of person than him. Sure, I loved a good scrap every once in a while, but I also prefer simpler solutions to the complexities of life. Hence, this minigun. All you had to do was point it in a general direction and shoot. You didn't even have to aim it, really. Nothing that fired 50 rounds per second had to be precise. Case in point. Seven elves were running at me with murder in their eyes, with a dozen more entering the room behind them. I couldn't speedily think of any clever plans to counter their charge. I didn't have years of martial training that would let me crush them in battle like Borman. Heck. Even if I had turned around to escape, I wouldn't have been able to outrun elves if I had a 50 yard head start. All I had was this big fucking gun, and plenty of time to squeeze the trigger. And as the Lord said before resting on the seventh day, this was enough. The minigun went...
I'm not doing any more. <laughs> when I released the trigger, there weren't any elves coming at me anymore. Just a lot of fresh, chunky salsa waiting to be canned. It felt a little like cheating. Pete? Requesting a reload, I said to him. Done, sir. Thank you, I said. You're very welcome, he replied. Okay, it was definitely cheating, but that was okay by me. I was the one wearing the forge ring. Now it was time to find Vexevius and end this. Together, Borman and I entered the depths of the mansion, seeking to bring our enemy to justice. <laughs>